Well, we here in the School of Behavioral Sciences at Cal Southern are very excited to have with us Catherine Whitaker um, present to us today a proven evidence-based treatment for those suffering with chemical dependency. The matrix, models, matrix model for addictions treatment, and I'm sure we all know someone or have a loved one or treated someone in therapy that has been going through chemical dependency. So this is something that's very applicable to us professionally as well as in our personal lives. Catherine Whitaker is the Director of Clinical Services for the Matrix Institute Addictions for Addictions. Ms. Whitaker is a licensed marriage and family therapist and a licensed professional clinical counselor. She is currently an approved supervisor for the American Association for Marriage and Family Therapy, and she's also um, the and the California Association for Marriage and Family Therapists. She has presented domestically in, and internationally in Washington, D.C., Iceland, Colombia, and Turkey. Catherine is currently an adjunct professor for Pepperdine and Chapman Universities. Her courses and clinical trainings include motivational interviewing, chemical dependency, group process, couple and family therapy theories, human sexuality, psychopathology, and community, community mental health and recovery. She received her Bachelor of Arts from Vanguard University and her Master of Science from Loma Linda University and is currently completing her doctorate degree in psychology right here at Cal California Southern University. So let's please give her a warm Cal Southern welcome to Ms. Catherine Whitaker. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you a little bit about the matrix model. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk uh, a little bit about the basic principles of addiction. I'm just gonna give you a little brief overview. Um, and then some characteristics of the matrix model <clears throat> in working with people with chemical dependencies. Okay, the American Society of Addiction Medicine um, says that um, addiction is a primary and chronic disease of the brain reward, um, motivation and memory. It's dysfunction in these areas lead to characteristics of biological, psychological, social and spiritual manifestations. And this is reflected in an individual uh, pathologically pursuing reward and or relief substance abuse um, by substance abuse and other behaviors. And this is taken straight from the American Society on Addiction Medicine. Um, the, they talk about the characteristics of addiction in the American Society of Addiction Medicine um, being the inability to abstain from a substance, um, impaired in behavioral control, cravings, uh, which we'll talk a little bit about in a few minutes, diminished recognition of problems um, and behaviors in interpersonal relationships, and also dysfunctional emotional response. Um, it also involves the cycles of relapse and remission. Okay, and without treatment, engagement, and recovery, some of these activities um, and addiction is progressive and can result in the disability and even sometimes premature death. So they talk about genetic factors of addiction, they talk about environmental factors of addiction, cultural factors, and also other factors. And you can also go on their website and get a lot more information on, on addiction. So basically what we're talking about is the limbic system. And I just added the pretty pictures to kind of give you a visual. I'm a very visual learner, so I like to see colors and I like to see brains. Um, so this just talks about the limbic system. As you can see, there, there's the limbic gyrus and, and the, the different colors. But what I want to focus on mainly is just the um, amygdala, hippocampus, and hypothalamus. Those are the main parts of the limbic system. And those structures involve the expression of emotions. It's sometimes called as the emotional brain, or the, the, real, the reptilian brain. Um, um, and it also is deep within your, your brain. And so what happens is it, it gives those particular uh, related um, emotions to survival, fear, anger, flight or fight response. And, and then we have the prefrontal cortex. So that's the end of your brain. And the prefrontal cortex is the far, part of the frontal lobe, and it lies just behind your forehead. It's often re referred to as the CEO of the brain. Um, it's responsible for cognitive analysis and abstract thinking. And, and it also helps you make right choices. And it also takes in for information and in, in, in all of the senses and the thoughts, and then it, it kind of helps you rationalize out your process. And that's the little picture. It's located in the front of the brain. 
also the the limbic the prefrontal cortex is one of the last parts of the brain to develop so you, your brain starts from the back to the front so the limbic system is already in and then the prefrontal cortex takes a little bit longer to reach that maturation and so what happens is um, some of the thought processing and it's usually between 23 and 25 that's why we have a lot of um, adolescents that have issues with you know they're very emotional they make decisions on emotion because they haven't even developed that part of the brain that helps you make those rational choices that's why I think um, renting a car when you're 25 it's probably why they have that little law in place. Um, and so organizing your thought behaviors, forming strategies and planning, shifting and adjusting behaviors and situations to change, modulation of intense emotions, and then it also inhibits those other, um, uh, initiating, uh, those another initiating inappropriate behaviors as well. So the brain model what we work with in, at the Matrix um, Institute is how the limbic system and the prefrontal cortex, how they communicate. And sometimes we use it as your limbic system is deep, hidden deep within your brain and the frontal, prefrontal cortex is what makes those rational choices, right? But sometimes when alcohol or substances are in, introduced, the, it stops the communication and that limbic system kind of goes crazy and like, yay, you know, we're going to have a party and the prefrontal cortex stop, stops working. And so that limbic system is saying, look, I have to survive. I'm going to have to steal from my parents so that I can survive, so that I can live and, um, and breathe and survive. So what happens is the prefrontal cortex doesn't help it anymore making those right choices and, and you, they really are thinking differently. And that's kind of what, um, why we do what we do cognitive behaviorally in our program. So the cognition during addiction, um, sometimes there's, there's the introductory phase, which is the relief from depression and anxiety, insomnia, you know, people first, first start um, taking substances. Um, it, it, you, it increased your status, your energy, your um, sexual confidence, your work, and it also might be illegal. Some of the, um, even though if it might be expensive, you're still getting some kind of relief. And so in that introductory stage, you have triggers where it's parties, special occasions, and the responses are pleasant thoughts about amusing and no, no real physiological response and you're not really using that often. So at the beginning of addiction, people are just like, we're social, we're enjoying it and um, not really too many um, cost, benef you know, cost benefits. So what happens then is that development of the craving response begins and it starts entering, for example, and I, I didn't add the pictures on this one, but what happens is when you enter the site to maybe where you get your substances. Then you use the substance. And then what happens is you have the effect of the substances, right? So you enter, you use, you get the effect. And that's the in introductory phase. And just think kind of like Pavlov's talk a little bit, the, the conditioned response, right? So then there's the abuse phase. And there's all these other effects that go into the abuse phase. But just to kind of center it down, the craving response is you enter the site, you have a physiological response already. Remember that Pavlov's dog, when they rang the bell, he already started salivating because your body starts to react to that, I'm gonna eat, I'm, gonna, I'm really hungry, I'm gonna eat. You know, even those of us maybe that go shopping or, you know, we might have a favorite restaurant and then we start salivating, or, you know, that's the same kind of thing. Your body's starting to react because your brain already knows what's gonna happen. But then what happens is in the abuse phase, you have that response and then you use the substance and then you get those effects of the substance. And of course, the abuse phase is you're gonna have a lot more intense physiological responses. Your body's gonna react a little bit more severe. Then you've got the addiction phase where you have that craving response, the thoughts, the mild response, and then you enter those power physiological responses and the use of substance effects. That's actually um, in, in the, um, the addiction phase. So once you go into the site, you're already thinking about it and you're going to already have a mild response even just thinking about going into the site to use. And this could be um, a lot of times in our program when you have, say, you're, you leave work. We would have um, some clients that would say, I'll leave work. I drive by the ATM. I grab money out. Then I go by the 7-Eleven. Then I'll pick up alcohol. And then I'll get home. And on their way home, that's their, that's their nightly routine. So we would have to say, OK, so the minute he leaves work or she leaves work, they're thinking about the ATM machine. Well, they're really thinking about the alcohol. And their body's already reacting to that response. They go to the ATM machine. And then it's really hard for them to get out of that pattern. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And then you have the severe um, dependency phase where you have that craving response and then just the thought of using takes its place and you already have that powerful response. So your body is already reacting to a substance that you haven't even started taking yet. Okay, and that's where it starts to become overwhelming and that's where that limbic system and the prefrontal cortex are just kind of 
not connecting at all. They're not communicating. And it's oh, your limbic system that I have to survive, I have to be okay, overpowers the rational thoughts. So imagine this even worse in teens where they're already moved by their emotions and they haven't developed that, um, that cognition to be able to overcome the conditioned response. So let's talk a little bit about the matrix model. So what happens is it's a proven evidence-based protocol that's been used to treat drug and um, alcohol abusers nationally and internationally for over 25 years. And the reason for this is there's a lot of times when um, people study and they, they, they write theories and we're, we all we go through PhD programs, excuse me, mm, we generate studies within a, an, a university setting and then we usually will study university students or different populations. Well, this model came out of the cocaine epidemic back in the 80s. They were, they were trying to figure out how to condition, how to use cognitive behavioral treatments to help people with addiction. But what was happening was when they started seeing the individuals and understanding what they're going through, a lot of the matrix model um, uh, ideas and handouts came from actually talking to individuals. So it's actually a, a program that after they started seeing what was happening and what the individuals were saying about addiction and about how they were recovering and what they needed to do, they drew from those experiences, they created this manual and they thought that this is actually working for them. And then so what happened was when SAMHSA, which is the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, came to us and said, hey, we'd like to study this model, we had already had, we had, we had everything and it was actually from the clients themselves. So that's why it's a ready-made intensive outpatient program um, and any treatment center can implement it. Um, it's a psychosocial program so it's, not, it's a psychoeducational group program so it's not intensive process. It's very cognitive to help your brain in that first four months heal so that process can come after. All that to save for one slide. So what happens is that one of the principles of um, the matrix models, it's um, a structure and expectations. They establish positive and collaborative relationship with the clients. Obviously we know and um, working in the field that it's the relationship that you have with the client is one of the highest and most important things for in, in treatment outcomes. Um, that we teach information and cognitive behavioral concepts, positively reinforce the positive behavior change. It's a, it's a combination of motivational interviewing, um, cognitive behavioral therapy and um, and contingency management. And I'll show you in a minute how that works. So positively reinforce the positive behaviors for change, provide corrective feedback when necessary, um, educate the family so we, we really incorporate the family into the program as well. Um, and then we talk about regarding stimulant abuse recovery and that was because of from the SAMHSA um, a study we, we focused mainly on stimulant users however we work with all different addictions. We introduce and encourage self-help participation, and we use your analysis to monitor drug use, and I'll explain that to you in a minute. So it's a multi-format um, program that's made up of early recovery, relapse prevention, family education, individual sessions, social support, urine testing, and a relapse analysis. Okay, we'll go through each of those. Okay, so this is what I was talking about to you before. Cognitive behavioral therapy, that's the most important part. Remember, helping your brain, helping you understand why we do the things we do, helping us avoid, um, avoid uh, negative situations. Um, that's, that's the thing in our brain. We're, we're, we're just training ourselves to make sure that we, we use those techniques, right? And then motivational interviewing. A lot of times um, when we work with addiction, um, people that have suffered from addiction use, uh, sometimes we tend to think that they have to hit rock bottom before they can change or they have to, uh, you know, we have to say, oh, they think, they already think that they're bad people, like, oh, I shouldn't be doing this and I can do this and why can't they just stop? You know, why can't we just stop? You know, that kind of a thing. And so it's, there's a stigma attached to that. Whereas if you see them as individuals that suffer from the same from addictions from something that's very hard for them to control we can help motivate them in their ambivalence and that's what the spirit of motivational interviewing comes and some more of a collaborative um, client-centered treatment so it helps it's more of a I would say a nurturing treatment rather than say look you did this wrong and punitive and we're gonna stop so we when we, someone has relapse in the program we don't say oh you're out of the program 
we say, let's talk about that, and it opens up a, a conversation for them to stop using again. And a lot of times, you know, in, there's relapse is a part of uh, recovery, but in the whole re new recovery movement, that we incorporate the substance use with the recovery model as far as even self-efficacy, Built, instilling hope in people, and that's the same with mental health, right? So we put them together, we say, look, you know, we know you're having issues with this, but we want to make sure that your ambivalence, we talk about ambivalence and making that, motivating them to change, helping them find pros and cons and helping them draw within themselves to change. And that's a little bit different than saying, look, you have to follow these rules and then you'll change. Um, another thing is, is we've had a lot of, um, mandated clients. In, in, one of, in our studies, we did this study, you know, the five studies across the United States, and one of the studies we did business as usual versus the matrix model, that's what the SAMHSA study was. And what we found is that um, when you add this component to their, to their treatment, they were able to, to recover and stay recovered longer. When there was one place that was the same as us, but that was because they were all mandated to be there. So they, they didn't drop out. They had to be there, right? You want to get your, your felonies expunged. You want to get your, you know, your use finished. You have to do the program or else you go to jail. We do have one program that we do the, um, the mandated uh, treatment. And I'll show you when I go through the components of the matrix model, the fidelity, we call it to fidelity, because when you do a study, you have to make sure that you make sure that the model goes to the actual way that the study was performed, otherwise your outcomes may be different. So what we do is you, anyone can modify the matrix model to fit their program, and so in one of our programs, because they have to come either more often than an intensive outpatient program or less often, we make sure that we modify it to make sure that they're successful in their treatment. And a lot of times when you're mandated to come and you just don't want to be there, they still, I've, I've heard um, over and over testimonials of people where they say, and we get all emotional, that matrix has saved their life and they, th they thank the judge for it, and they, they thank us for just taking the time to make sure that they're better. And I can't tell you the stories that you hear from the graduations of them, and they have to do it for 18 months. I mean, they're in there forever. They, you feel, it's a four-month program, but they have to come over and over again, and then come to aftercare, and come every week, and be tested every week, and, and um, it's, it's life-changing. And so once you f hear that a couple times from uh, some people, you know that that emotional side of your brain works, but you know that something's happening to help them change and not go back. So. What we do with our, and, and I'll move on to the social, um, the, this, it's called um, social support group that we have that I talked about earlier. They are allowed to come back to that for as long as they want. We have people that have been on our social support groups for 17 years, 15 years. They come back and they, um, they really help give back because they know that what their life has been and what it was before, okay? So also we have the contingency management piece, which is, you know, Remember when you were in kindergarten and you had little stickers or when you do parenting and you're like, put the star in the chart, good job, you know, and then you're going to get a, a reward. Well, we do that with our calendars. So the beginning of the session, you come in and you put the dots on your calendars and that shows that you get a reward for staying sober. And that shows the stickers. I don't know if you, any of you watched college football, but you know how the, if you make a touchdown, you get a sticker on your helmet? It's like, woo! All these college big burly guys getting stickers on their helmets. It's the same concept, right? Why do they like it? I, I think it's the matter of, if you, of you supporting their positive behaviors. And if you get us, you know, so if they are sober one more day, that's huge positive for people that are in recovery. For those of us that have any other issues that go on, we, we all have issues that we try to overcome and um, being late to work and like, gosh, if I could just be on time one day this week, you know, once we overcome that, it's just, it, it's such a feeling of accomplishment and that's where that self-efficacy piece comes in, us believing in them, that they can do it. And you don't have to be in recovery to work with them. You don't have to not be in recovery to work with them. You just have to believe that they can get better and believe in them. And because if they don't think that you believe in them, that's, it's, you know, why, why are you doing what you're doing and why are they doing, why are they there, right? Okay, so then there's the 12-step facilitation. We don't, uh, we have some sheets that talk about 12-step 12-step participation. Some people are um, adverse to 12-step, but we always have 12-steps on our sites because we, we support 12-step uh, involvement, and that's that support once they leave our clinic. They have to be able to go out and have some kind of support. So we have other things. We have smart recovery. We have other um, places that they can go that may, that if they're not comfortable with 12-step, but we'll always have a 12-step meeting um, on our sites. We have four sites and we have 12-step meetings at every one of them on a Saturday or on a, in an afternoon. 
And then family therapies. What we do with our family education group is one hour a week or one um, two hour block a week, we have the family come in. We educate the family. We can also, you can also bring the family in for treatment, but that way we get, you know, they say it takes a village and that's not, everyone loves to be supported and, and not just be out there on their own. Even when you're children, it takes a village, but when you're an adult, if you have no one to go to for support, it's really not beneficial, especially to your recovery. And I'm seeing a lot of people after several years of recovery relapse, and a lot of it is when they forget where they came from, but they also lost the support and, and the knowledge of the ongoing um, sobriety. So we really love to incorporate the family. So it doesn't have to be your mom and your dad or your children, it could be a friend. It could be someone that you're close with, because we, you know, family is a, a broad definition for most. Okay, so let's talk a little about the early recovery goals. So we have the first step is early recovery, right? You want to give them the, the information that they need when they're early, when they're recovering from addiction at the very beginning stages. So we provide a structured place for new clients to learn about the skills and self-help programs. We introduce the clients to basic tools of recovery. And remember, this whole thing is manualized. I'll re reiterate that at the end. It's a manualized uh, model. So what happens is we have early recovery handouts. We have a therapist manual that explains the handouts. And then we have the relapse prevention handouts that go for a certain amount of weeks. And you can stretch them out. You can, you can do them over twice. It's, they're not going to um, get mad at you if you say the same um, early recovery topic twice. Because the more you talk about it, the, the more they're going to get from it. And remember, the more excited you are, the more excited they're going to stay. Um, we introduce the tools of recovery, introduce the outside participation, and we create within them um, an expectation of, of participation as um, part of treatment. And it helps them adjust to the participating in the groups and in matrix and outside to the social support groups, maybe the 12-step groups or the smart recovery groups. It also allows the client and the co-leader to provide a model gating instant abstinence. So what happens is uh, the co-leader, you're thinking, what's the co-leader? Um, a lot of times when someone graduates from the program, they come back, they sign up to volunteer, and they help co-lead the group. Because we have a lot of MFTs, we have psychologists, we have people that might not be in recovery leading the groups because they have the skills and the, the training that are effective in this treatment. But they might not have that experience um, of the recovery process, so what we do is we incorporate the co-leaders to come in with us. And that way, when I ran groups, it was it was so beneficial for me because she may be able to, my co-leader was able to call them out on something and I'd be like, oh, okay, let's just all get along. You know, it was very nurturing. And, and then she'd be like, oh no. You can't do that, you know? And so it was a really good balance to be able to have someone that had been through the program, knows the questions, knows what sometimes they're trying to trip you up on, and then they're able to kind of check in as well. It's a, it's a, great, um, it's a great way to collaborate with that, especially if you don't have that history yourself. Um, they provide a, a model of gaining that initial abstinence because it is an abstinence model. We want them to be free from all drugs and alcohol, so if they come in for alcohol addiction but they still think that they can um, do meth, <laughs> they can do <clears throat> marijuana, or they're just there for a DUI, we, st we encourage them to be abstinent from everything. We say for the first four months, just stay abstinent for the first four months, you know, your choice afterwards, but usually once they're in, then of course that limbic system and that prefrontal cortex start to communicate again, the brain starts to heal, and then they start thinking clearly. Yeah, and usually after the first, second month. And then they start to think, oh, okay, maybe I need to abstain and, and stay sober and stay away from this type of situation. And, and so it takes a few months, a couple months, but then once they're in, then they understand the whole reasoning behind that. <clears throat> um, it also allows <clears throat> and provides for the, the client and the co-leader with increased self-esteem and reinforce their progress, right? The other... Um, effective tool of the co-leader also helps with that self-esteem because they see someone that's already gone through it. And if you know in motivational interviewing, <clears throat> one of the things is to see where their successes have been before. So if they've been able to be sober for, one gentleman I had was sober for nine years and he used. And then he was sober for nine years and he used. I said, let's make this ten years. Let's get you past that nine year mark. Because I think once sometimes someone has a success and it can't just not necessarily be in, in um, 
addiction. It could be in anything. And you have a failure, you tend to not have that same self-esteem, and then you kind of sub subconsciously start to sabotage yourself because you're really not used to it. You don't really know what success is. So we'd rather stay in that known than the unknown. And what we need to know, they need to know is that that unknown can be even better. So we give them that encouragement and, and help raise their self-esteem. Some of the topics that we have, there's um, many topics in these um, different, the, the manual, but scheduling and calendars. Remember I was telling you about the calendars? And then we talk about scheduling. We talk about scheduling your time. You know, they always say give a busy person something to do because you know they'll get it done. And I don't know if any of you that schedule, especially working here or um, going to school here, you have to schedule or else you're just like, the month's gone by and you're like, oh no, I have 16 assignments due. So that never happened to me. Maybe, maybe not. Um, so you want to make sure scheduling is important. Feel free to take that little piece out of that manual and I like to schedule myself. Um, because it is important to make sure that you're managing your time appropriately. Um, and it also leaves, doesn't leave room for you to mess up or to, your mind to wander. or you think, maybe I should go back to that ATM. Maybe I should go down to that street, right? Or maybe you should go shopping at that mall. Um, okay, so then there's the questions, um, questionnaires and charting, and um, that's, that's another topic. There's also the 12-step introduction, some alcohol issues. You know, why if I'm here for meth, should I stop drinking? And we talk about things like that. We're very open about different things and reasoning why, because sometimes your brain doesn't know the difference between two different drugs, you know? Um, we also were incorporating even other um, addendums. We have a lot of different um, samples of our, our program for um, American Indian population, for women. We have a women's manual that we just adapt and SAMHSA has that one. So we, we, we're always trying to update and make sure things are um, appropriate. We're introducing um, probably uh, taking medication, things like that for co-occurring disorders. So we're updating that piece right now. Um, thoughts, emotions, and behaviors, and what, what that topic is is where your thoughts happen, hit your emotions, and then the behaviors follow. And I know none of us have thought that. You know, I mean, I when I worked in, in Orange County, um, I always used to go to Nordstrom's a lot for lunch. I just love their little cafe and that soup and salad. And so whenever I think of Nordstrom's, and now all of a sudden I think of the lunch and the and I want that little cheese stuff, cheese bread, and that's all I can think of. And so my behaviors are like, where are we? I'm gonna just and I just find myself in Nordstrom's. I'm like, wait a minute, how did I get here? And then, of course, I decided to stay for lunch. That kind of thing. Then we have relapse prevention goals. It's to allow client interactions with other individuals in recovery. And um, in this section, we um, present, uh, we allow them and we, we have a lot of communication in the groups. We present specific prevention material. We allow the co-leader to share the long-term sobriety experience. Remember going back to those successes. We produce group cohesion among the clients. You know, when you have a group, if any of you have ever been in a group or ran a group, that group cohesion is so important. And the good thing about the matrix model is it's not a closed group, which means it doesn't go for this amount of weeks and then they're done. You can run it that way if you want. Like I said, you can make it, you can make it fit to the community that you live. However, it works really well as an open group as well because once the person comes in, you've got all these people with this experience that have already been there a few months, knows, know the rules, know what to say, and then they can just um, bring them in and help encourage them as well. Help encourage the abstinence, help encourage all the other behaviors that maybe the, the leader is trying to explain to them. Um, it allows the leader to witness that um, interpersonal and the interaction of the clients. Because, you know, when you're in there and you can see someone nodding off, you see, you know, something going on, you can really be able to identify when you've seen those, when you've seen that for a while. Um, allow clients to benefit from the per, uh, and participation in a long-term experience. So that's that, the four months in that relapse prevention. Some of the topics, alcohol, the legal drug, boredom, it's a huge one with them. They get bored because they forget how, how to have fun. Um, a lot of times we have an adolescent um, treatment manual as well, and a lot of times with our adolescent, we're teaching them how to have fun sober. So we do a lot of, we have a, an adult and an adolescent model. We also have a different study going on in one of our clinics, so we really focus on making sure that they, you know, for us, we sometimes forget how to have fun as adults, but um, when, you're, when you're using drugs, you, you forget that you can have fun without having that added. Um, the added um, stimulant for you. 
Uh, motivation for recovery, why do we want to recover? Truthfulness, um, work in recovery, staying busy, dealing with our feelings, sex in recovery, defining spirituality, and managing anger. So there's just, they, they try to hit all the topics of your body and of, of your environment just to kind of give you an overview of let's look at some stuff. And it's not, there's no judgment, there's no, um, you have to do things this way. It's just giving you other opportunities to be able to think outside your, um, your box. Um, so it's evidence-based and it integrates, uh, integrates the therapeutic model incorporating, we've talked about this, the cognitive behavioral motivational interviewing and enhancement because motivational enhancement therapy is also a book that SAMHSA has as well but there is the one by Steve Miller and, and um, Rolnick I mean Bill Miller and Steve Rolnick um, motivational interviewing they just have to, brought out the third edition as well but there's also a SAMHSA version of that too you can download that from SAMHSA um, contingency management the, the therapeutic elements um, in group they talk about the psychoeducation group, the social support and family education group, which we touched on, and individual couple and family therapy, and then that 12-step facilitation. So what it is, federally recognized, the National Registry of Effective Programs um, and Practices talk about it as um, uh, an evidence-based treatment model. Um, the Center for Substance Abuse Treatment and the National Institute on Drug Abuse. You can see us in their um, first and second edition on a research-based model. They talk about the models that are effective in working with drug addiction, and they have motivational interviewing, they have cognitive behavioral therapy models, and they have the matrix model, because it envelops all of those, and p because of the study that SAMHSA did on all those five programs. The o Office of Drug, and, um, drug Control Policy, the Department of Justice, and then um, it's also recognized by different drug strategies. So our group treatment strategy, let me explain a little bit about that. Just checking the time. Um, orientation to the matrix group. So the topics are sequential. There's really a method to our madness as far as making sure that topics go in order. You, like I said, you don't have to do it to fidelity. If we, we have certified clinics that do the matrix model to certification. We have a certification program, so we can put them on our website and say, look, these do it to fidelity. We go out and we test them after six months of treatment. We send them certifications. Um, we just certified a, the Abu Dhabi National Recovery um, NRC, the center in the Emirates, and we just trained for their psychologists were in Vietnam and Guam and Thailand, and I'll show you that a little bit more later on. So we do train people to go out and do the model um, to fidelity to make sure that it's the same as our, how we had it studied. Um, however, if you don't, you can take out a topic or whatever is modules for yours. We have a methadone clinic as well, and we do a treatment enhanced services for methadone patients in one of our clinics. We don't do it to fidelity there because they come every day. There's over 300 you know, people coming through the clinic every day, and then we want to make sure that they have groups appropriate for them, so we may shorten the groups instead of lengthen them um, because of the intensive outpatient treatment um, modifications. So instead of you know nine hours a week, we, they might be doing four hours a week or five, depending on if they come every day. We want to make sure that they get what they need for their for, for them to be a success. Um, the, I told you before, um, each manual, the client manuals kept on site, so we give everyone a copy, and then they have their own little manuals. They come in, they grab their name, they have their manual. They can when they're finished, they can take it home if they have. Um, some people don't want to, some people do. They've written notes on it. They've been able to refer to it later. Um, and then we have the group size, they're 10 to 12 because they're, it's um, an intensive model that we found that that size is really um, important. Although we do have our social support group, which is anyone can come. Some of them, sometimes they come up to 30 people in, in the group just because it's that ongoing um, night for the rest of your life, <laughs> if you want. Um, depending on the population, you might not want it to be that large, but it's, it's uh, an effective group. The ER and RP groups, that's the early um, uh, recovery and the relapse prevention groups are run by the same counselor and all the clients of those group are the counselor's clients. Um, and we have the co-leaders which I talked about the peer mentors to use in the groups and um, they uh, we make sure that we're proficient and familiar with the topics so what we do is we have a therapist manual that we go every topic has a little introduction so the therapists can always refresh themselves they go over the topic themselves and then when they go into the into the program people can take turns reading or you know it depends on the way you, that they do it so far so good right? 
Let's talk about um, the, the sample schedule. This is a sample because remember, when you're doing an intensive patient program, a lot of the managed care companies, you have to have three hours. So say this is six to seven and seven to seven thirty. So now we do, um, we'll, we might do, um, we do six to nine actually, because it's gotta be a three hour program. But this is where, this one's modified because this was how it was studied. So six to seven is early recovery, seven to eight thirty is relapse prevention. There's your weeks one through four weeks 5 through 16 and 17 through 52. And so you see how we have the family ed um, every Wednesday. So what we do is we make sure that there's not three days or more without a group. You want to keep people um, under, uh, you know, we want to keep them in, um, accountable to their group, because even for us, right? That's why we have supervision in MFT and in psychology. That's why you have your. That's why you keep records. That's why we do things that we do. Because even with the, the a minimal supervision or a minimal type of accountability, it gives us that room to go into the gray area. You know, you still take a pencil or a post-it from work, and then pretty much you're taking the couch or the, you know, maybe not, but. You know what I mean? It gives you that room. So you never want that room to be able to go, oh, well, you know, I don't really have group until Wednesday. It's going to be five days I could use, and, I, and then I could flush, and then I, you know what I mean? It gives, because, you know, that's what we do, right? You're using your mind. You're trying to figure out a way to stay clean when you're taking that drug test, right? So um, we usually do Monday, Wednesday, Friday groups, or we'll do a Monday, Thursday, Friday group, or we'll do a Tuesday, Wednesday, fr Friday group, depending on, um, well, we wouldn't do Tuesday. We do Monday. We wouldn't. That would be four days. So it'd be Monday, Thursday, Friday, or um, uh, yeah. So we just make sure that there's always there's never more than three days. You can do Saturday. Saturdays it's always the twelve step um, in some of our programs. Others it's on the Wednesday. Um, so. They, we do the re early recovery, we do the relapse prevention. Some of the models, some of them will do early recovery the whole time and just repeat it to make sure that they have those skills. Some of them do early recovery and relapse prevention and then you can add other groups in there like mindfulness and um, uh, seeking safety. Women's groups, we have for the drug, and that, remember I told you we have that mandated program? So they do gender specific groups. So we have a men's group, we have a women's group. You know, because they're there for 18 months, we don't want to keep going through, you know, how many times am I going to hear about, it? you know, uh, my schedule, or that should be every day. But you know what I mean? So that gives them that variety and that op option to even enhance their treatment even that much more. And then the urine testing, it depends obviously on the contract or the group, but it's um, conducted weekly. And um, it's not a punitive thing saying, hey, you're, you know, you're, you, your test came back positive, you're out of the program. Remember I said it's not a punitive measure. It's just to be able to monitor them and say, look, something's happening, something's going on with you. Let's see what's happening. So what we do is we retrace their steps. We have, we have other individual and conjoint sessions, which I'll come, I'm coming up to. Um, we talk about that. We have sections where it's like how we can help monitor them, how we can help them be a success. Let's, let's go back and trace our steps and see what's going on with you. Um, one of our samples is defining spirituality. This, was, this one's more popular in our methadone maintenance treatment program because we have a lot of older adults because they're of their long-term use and they have a heightened sense of spirituality and they're in touch with God and different things and so they really focus on this one um, whereas the others might focus more on um, you know, the triggers, thoughts, cravings used. Um, ones and the, the younger uh, people that are in the other programs. But so what happens, I've told you before, the group facilitator has clients read through each topic and they pause them to give their answers. And so they just fill it out. It's a manualized treatment form. They share their responses. Some of them might say, I don't like spirituality. And that's, I mean, we're not judging them on their spirituality. If they don't like, then we talk about that and we give them that opportunity and we, we create tolerance in the group as well to be able to ha let people have their own ideas and suggestions because everyone's at different levels and everyone has different um, ideas and so we make sure that we're culturally aware and, and um, sensitive to them. Okay, and then we also, this is an example of the helping checklist for families. So the facilitator reads through the topic, pausing periodically to allow the clients to share their experiences regarding each situation. The family members check the items that they're willing or they're able to do for the person in recovery. And then they switch handouts and circle them and they're willing to allow the other members to help with them and talk about how um, families can get involved. And it really helps support that community of families. So sometimes you feel like, oh my gosh, I'm all alone. My, my son or my daughter or my mom or my dad are in recovery. And it gives them that extra support that other people are going through the same thing that they're going through. 
Okay, so now we just have some frequently asked questions usually about our model. So just wanted to kind of come through and before the questions and to tell you what people ask regularly. Um, what makes it different from other programs? So remember I talked a little bit before, um, it's a program for stimulant treatment approaches, but also you can, the, because that model, the research just did stimulants, other people, they, they had other drugs and, um, and alcohol when we did the study, but for that study's sake, all the manuals are going to refer to stimulants when you download the SAMHSA manuals. The, the manuals from Hazleton, which is our publisher, they're going to include all the, 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 the drugs. Um, the authors um, are leading authorities in meth and stimulants and, and treatment in the United States. The authors of this program have been doing it for 30 years. They're, um, one's a psychologist, one's an, an MA, and one's a, got his master's and been doing research for 30 years. He's been doing research in every clinic well, of ours, have had a, a research um, a group in there at least once, or tw well, at least once. There's been a lot, and he, he's a genius, I have to say. He's a genius. Um, so between the three of them, when they started organizing this program and bringing other doctors in and people in to help with it, it just blossomed into an amazing program, and it was just a very collaborative effect. And it talks about family urine testing, that a lot of times programs might have let's just all come in and pay a lot of money and just kind of do some groups and, you know, get help. But they don't include, maybe they won't include the family, or they might not include the urine testing, um, or they might not um, uh, have a specific manualized group so that all the counselors are teaching the clients the same things to make sure that your outcomes are, are still going to be a little bit the same so you can kind of make sure that it's coming, that you're doing your, what you say you're doing. Um, and then they were also, I told you at the very beginning that they're developed in university settings, but remember this was developed through actual work with patients in the community. We have a, um, one of the handouts is called Be Smart, Not Strong. And one of, one of our, the researcher was in a session with one of the clients, and this was, you know, 25 years ago. And he said, you know, I, I just can't, I just can't do this, I can't be strong. He goes, be, star be smart, not strong. And that became one of our sayings in Matrix for years to come. And people say that all over the world now. And it came from just a session working with a client. Um, so it's also a manualized treatment, intensive outpatient treatment model, and it's very easy to implement. We do have trainings on it every other month, um, but it's very easy to implement because it's, it's made for people to come in and just really it to be effective. Um, what's the background? We talked about that. It was funded by NIDA grant in the 80s. It's the only um, specific treatment model that was endorsed by NIDA um, as an evidence-based treatment approach, scientifically based treatment um, in the principles of, of drug addiction, and you can look that up also on the web. Um, it was recently tested in the CSAT methamphetamine treatment, and it also is uh, the largest randomized clinical trial that, um, for treatments of methamphetamine to date. Where can I find the manual? So what I told you about before, SAMHSA, which is over here. SAMHSA, they have the, the this is what the counselor's treatment manual looks like, the handbook looks like, and also there's one using working with women. You can download this from the inter internet, um, and you can um, order them, they're free, and you can look through the models, it's about a third grade reading. Um, and then we have the Hazelton manuals. Those are a little bit more pricey. They come with really fancy stickers, fancy coins, and um, they have these really great, uh, these great things for teens. Um, this is our adolescent outpatient treatment model, and then our um, adult. The adolescent has a lot, the pages are fun, and it's very hip and cool for adolescents because we know we have to be hip and cool when we're working with adolescents or else they won't listen to us. So <clears throat> we've made sure that model is um, appropriate for them. We do have ongoing uh, lessons in one of our clinics as well, and it's been very effective. Um, why is the 12 step treatment important? We talked about that, right? Studies have shown in combining that spiritual aspect, um, such as the 12 steps, improves their chances of long term abstinence, and they support the concepts discussed in the treatment at no cost. Um, they're also um, not denied access to treatment if they're opposed to going to those meetings, and I told you about that before. Why is family involvement important? Now we all know why family involvement is important, right? Um, and I know there's a lot of words up here, but I just wanted to make sure you had all of the information. And in spite of the fact that research shows that treatment is more effective, the outpatient treatment fails to provide a component for families 
you know, where they have to come in. In our adolescent model, we have the families come in, but actually we do those separate. We'll see the families and the children at the same, t the adolescents at the same time, but in separate rooms so that the adolescents don't feel, um, you know, that the families are, you know, spying on them or anything. And then the families are able to get the education that they need to help be supported in working with those adolescents. We have a Spanish and an English parenting group. So they're a little bit different between the adults and the adolescents. Um, the authors of the matrix model, they incorporate that system as an easy way to administer. One of them was an MFT, which is a very systems family, family oriented person. So she really thought that that was really important to incorporate the family. Um, and, it's, and also families are involved to um, waking, making ways and reviewing possible ways to making that um, importance of getting um, sobriety and making that happen. We know what manualized means, right? It's that what is treatment, and that's what it is. It's the what of treatment. Um, it's not limited treatment, but it, they serve as a foundation of the program. It helps everyone stay consistent and make sure that we are all working from the same, um, on the same page. And the benefits is that training is much easier, the outcomes are standardized, and then clients complete the problem, they know that they have a set of information that they can use, and it's been um, researched. Um, it's also updated, and um, if you have one effective standardized program, then it allows them, to, um, it, it, it helps the counselors stay connected, obviously, and not make up their own stuff. I mean, they can use their little, sometimes people will bring in their guitars and you know, start the group off in a different way, but it just depends on you as a therapist coming in or as a counselor, but it helps you stay consistent with all the other counselors. Um, and we talked about the UA component, and mainly um, uh, the, the, the therapist manual has uh, components of treat, dealing with positive tests, uh, falsified specimens and observed tests and all the other concerns created for that. So we have actual treatment handouts that they can look at. Can we use it with diverse groups? Well, sometimes you think, okay, well, is this only population was studied? Um, the matrix model's been we, we've, we, like I said before, we went Thailand, Japan, Vietnam, Native Americans. We have a Native American manual, African Americans. We have a, actually a certified sites in South Africa now and in Spain. We have a sites there as well. Um, they've been translated into Spanish, Thai, Slavic, Japanese, and Korean. And um, it's not confrontational. So because we are really huge on being culturally competent and, and culturally aware, it's, it's, it works because you're not, um, it's not us doing something that it only works for us. It actually, it's working with a client and where they're at and their needs. Um, and it's very respectful of culture. And presents an alternative to treatment programs that might be a little bit more prescriptive. And it also can be tailored to specific populations. Remember I said you don't have to do it to fidelity. You can m modify it into your culture. Um, for example, in Hawaii, because one of the studies was in Hawaii, it allows the group participants to use that tradition of talk story. I don't know if you, uh, any of you have been to Hawaii and they talk, pigeon talk there. And, um, um, Talk story is when they just talk about their life and their history, and they talk in a way in their family traditions and their wisdom, and it, and it, it helps them incorporate the model, but it helps them incorporate it in their cultural in their way. Um, Co-occurring disorders, we talked a little bit about that, but it's also really great with working co with working with the co-occurring um, disorders and mental health. Um, it helps reduce that non, um, the goal is to reduce the use of non-prescribed drugs and alcohol while tracking that compliance and taking medications. So we work also with people with co-occurring disorders. We always make sure that we're aware of whatever medications they have, and then we work really closely with their doctors. And if they have an addiction specialist, if they have a psychiatrist working with them, if they have an, another therapist working with them, alongside of the group, we make sure we are in collaboration with all of them to make sure that this treatment is working and they're a success. Because isn't that what we're doing? We're trying to make people better and help them be successful in their lives. Um, and this is just some of the research that we have on the model. Uh, I know there's a lot of information here. If you go on our website, you can download any of our articles. We have a lot of research articles. It's really small print. I know a lot of you can't see that. Um, and then we also have some the references for here, a lot of time I use ASAM, I use the Center for Substance Abuse and um, the Office of Applied Studies. Um, a lot of the materials you can get online and you can go to our website, like I said, and you can just really download research and you'll see all of our articles on it as well. So thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Catherine. Fantastic job. Thank you. You've, uh...
You've inspired a lot of audience engagement. We have uh, uh, dozens and dozens of questions. That have Yay. Come in. So uh, I was going to start off with, uh, there are a bunch that came in regarding cultural issues, but you just uh, addressed that pretty effectively. So I'm going to skip to some others here. Um, uh, one that came up frequently, is the model effective for other addictions, particularly uh, uh, sexual addictions? We haven't studied it on sexual addictions. It's all chemically based. I know a lot of people have worked in, with, I know the, uh, we haven't done any studies on it. I don't want to say, yeah, it's great, but you can apply it to other addictions. I know a lot of people with the compulsion and the eating disorders it works really well with. Um, but with sexual addictions, you're going to, you would have to modify the model towards that, but you could probably take out parts of the, of the, um, of the manualized treatment part to be specific towards those addictions. But th try it. Oh, and I should let our audience know here. I'll take a few from the uh, virtual audience first and let, uh, let you collect your thoughts, and then I'll turn to the uh, in-person audience. Uh, you, you got at this issue a little bit in the, uh, towards the beginning of your talk, but uh, there are a number of questions coming in. Are counselors and therapists who are not in recovery themselves, what sort of disadvantages might they uh, be working under you know, in terms of establishing rapport, mm. trust, credibility? Huge. How, how, how do you deal with that? Well, I know me, I'm not personally in recovery myself, but when I, I took over a, a, a group for one of the other gentlemen that had left the clinic for a few months, and a lot of that was a question, and he, he was a very um, directive, hardcore counselor, and then they came to me, who was this nurturing, let's all just get along. And, and so I was worried about that at first, too, and I know a lot of people, when they come to, to therapy anyway, they say, you know, how can you help me? You don't know what I'm going through. I, I just say I don't know what you're going through. Um, I know what I've gone through and I'm not going to necessarily, this isn't about me, this is about your recovery. I know I have tools that I can help you with. I know that I believe in you and I know that you can get, um, you can recover. I just, I just know that if you can take from me what you need, then that would be great. Um, I haven't gone through a trauma of rape to deal with rape victims. I haven't gone through schizophrenia or a psychotic break, but I still care about individuals that have issues and I want to be able to treat them. So I hope that I can still be able to, to give you some tools. And at the end of that group, that was some of the outcomes. They said, you know, you had a different way, but it works like it worked for us and that was so refreshing to me to know that even though I didn't have the same style of their other and it's really hard to take over a group rather than start a group by yourself and but they still were able to establish that rapport and be able to be helped so do you, the fact. Do you experience a significant dropout uh, or relapse during the early recovery phase and what can you uh, what can and, and do you do to uh, counter this um, you know, I'm not sure about the the statistics on the dropout rate at the very beginning, because of that group cohesion and you have the it's an ongoing group. We don't see a lot of it, but there are going to be people, and it could be just environmental and, and work um, factors. But a lot of times we notice that in, just for our clinics, I'm not sure about the other clinics, but they'll come in because they have to. At, at the point that they come to our clinic, it's my wife's going to leave me, my husband's going to leave me, my work is going to fire me. Um, you know, these are the we have. A program that's got very high um, influential people in it, CEOs, lawyers, doctors. Then we have other groups that might be mandated and um, for other situations. So it really depends on the group cohesion and the environment around them. But they, they're usually pretty excited because we get them in the intake and then we do the, show them the process and then they, they really see that it's workable. And they can work during the day and come to a night group or they can work at night and go to a day group. So it works for them. I, we don't see a lot of that. Uh, just uh, one just came in as you were answering that, and it kind of relates to what we were just talking about. Well, if you experience a patient who seems to be, you know, p putting an effort into the program, mm -hmm. but con experiences frequent and continual relapses, is what what can you do with that with that person? Are there steps you take? Um, again, if their if their option is to stay, and that it's, it's a it's not a mandatory situation. If it's a mandatory situation, then obviously you have to incorporate the other people. But if they if they want to stay and they continue to relapse, then you'll you have to. What we do is we engage in more individual sessions with them. We increase their support. We have them come to even more groups just to give them that support that they need. And um, sometimes it's not a good fit for some. I mean, it's not for everybody. But you have to really, you know, make that choice to to really follow through, and it's 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 a hard choice. Okay, and this is a a, a couple questions came in there uh, a little more pragmatic. Uh, are there 
are there significant costs associated in acquiring the resources necessary to implement the, the uh, matrix model? And how long might it take to implement the model? Okay. Well, um, well, the the SAMHSA information you can download today. Well, you can. I'm not sure if you could download it. They might have to send it to you. You can start using it whenever you like. It's not that you have to use it to fidelity. Um, however, we do have an ongoing training every other month. We have a two-day matrix model training, and then we have a three-day supervisor training. So what you can do is you can come to that week be trained specifically on the model for two days. Um, I don't know the, the cost for sure. It's on our website. It's uh, about $500, $700, I think, for two days. And then you can do the supervisor training and become a certified supervisor to be able to implement it in your, in your group. And uh, we put you on our website, so you're always getting information from people all over the world on our, on our supervisor uh, model. And then you can implement it the next day if you want. And you can buy the Hazelton manual and implement it right away. It doesn't take a lot to implement it. It's very easy, actually. Okay, a uh, pretty specific question here. What do you, could you share some of the tools and techniques you use to teach teens, specifically, about uh, how to have fun without turning to substances? Sure. Um, well, well, they're still in the manual. We will do like um, staying away from certain situations, but then we also incorporate, before when we, we worked with them, we would take them out and model appropriate behaviors, but now since we don't do a lot of outings with them, in our program we will have video game sessions with them, we bring in food and we will have uh, dinner and have them all, and it's very much modeling appropriate behavior as the clinician to show them what to do and how to act in those situations. You've got to kind of be with her and, and show them that. And so we do that, a lot of games, a lot of things like that. Sports. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Any uh, questions from the... Great. Good morning. Bonnie Delgado and it's for Psi 86502. Um, I, I, I think this sounds like a wonderful model. Thank you. Uh, but what if you have friends or family that are in denial? Oh. How would one work with them? Well, it's everyone's option to come into treatment. We're not going to make anyone come into treatment. So we have a, a if, when you go on our website, we have an 800 number. It's 24 hours a day. We have people on call. 24 hours a day. So you can always call, your friends can call, the family members can call, and we can give you services. Also, SAMHSA has a treatment locator for treatment inpatient, outpatient. If someone's got some physical things that are dealing with like um, the, for like an alcohol, we're not gonna take someone in the same day if they're going through their DTs or if they're detoxing, so we have to make sure that they go through a program first, we make sure that we're doing the appropriate way, uh, way of outpatient. But if they don't want treatment, we're not going to make them come into treatment. We can have them come in for a free evaluation, and they can come in for free. They can tour the facility. They can we can talk to them about it, and then they can choose. But they're you know it's 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 their option. I mean, you have to really want to. That's the hardest part when you're a family member. Hi, I'm Janine. Thanks for being here. Hi. I'm in physiological psych, and I have two questions. The first hmm. is, did your research show any? Uh, difference in results for people under age 25 versus over mm. age 25. And then could you talk more about your specific facility and your staffing and, and how sure. many people are there? Are they consultants and part-time, full-time and things like that? And where is it located? Sure. Um, first of all, you want to go on our website and talk to our research director for the for the specific outcomes of 25, because I know it was 18 and over. And he may have that research of the specific gender, uh, age, gender specifics. And you can also look up our research probably on SAMHSA, but that's a really good question. And um, what, how we, right now we have four facilities in California. <laughs> off the top of my head, yes, we have 2,500. Um, uh, we have four facilities, San Fernando Valley, West LA, Rancho Cucamonga, and Mint City, LA. And the Rancho Cucamonga site is the site where we see adolescents. We see adolescent drug court and county. We have, um, we have a small staff there. It's probably like, I want to say like 10 people. Because you run the intensive groups, we, we, we work hard. And we run the groups, and we do the individuals, we do the drug testing, we do the, you know, we, we make sure that we um, help everybody, and it's an ongoing basis for them, and that's where we also have the adult drug um, court. So we go to drug court every Friday. They're actually there now. Yeah, hi. No, um, and so we do that in our um, Rancho office. Then in our West LA office is where we see um, the 
uh, it's the outpatient. We, see, we take all of the managed care programs. We take you know all of the those types, and we also have a cash basis. Those are a little bit more expensive programs because they're on the west side. So that's where we see the higher functioning populations. We, we tend to see that, and then in our Woodland Hills office is the same. Um, there we also have sorry there's so many programs um, prop 36 what it used to be now we have it's called PC 1210 in that program so we take that funding there's a lot of funding sources going on and then in our West LA office we also have a, a study going on for adolescents but it's not connected but we still get a lot of substance abuse study um, uh, op opportunities because we, we have matrix. Our, our Mid-City LA office is our methadone maintenance treatment model and we also are doing a cocaine study there as well but we also have that and we also have a TCE study which is called tr treatment and then you have enhanced treatment services so we have treatment for them and for people that can't afford it but we include um, the, the matrix model to help them encourage them to stay sober and it's medication assisted treatment. Oh, yeah. In our staffing, we have part-time, full-time, we have MFTs, we have interns, we have psychologists. Uh, we consult a lot with the, the medical doctors in the areas. It just really depends on what we need. We'll, we'll do. <laughs> it's a long answer. Hi. Good, good morning, Catherine. Hi. Thank you morning. very much for being here. Excellent Thank presentation. You. Thank I just you. have a couple of questions. Generally speaking, what are the clients whom you and your centers, centers treat saying about matrix in terms of why they're in matrix, the effectiveness they found with it versus other programs, because often clients have a long history of trying yeah. this program, that program. What we hear a lot of is we're not super fancy and expensive. I mean, we think we're fancy, but we, I mean, we are fancy in here. But we, we're not a residential program, but a lot of them have come out of residential programs and they found that it's, it's easier to stay recovered in an intensive outpatient program with the, the, the tools that we've given them rather than going inpatient for a long period of time and then just coming out and being, how do I handle myself? And so a lot of them have gone through a lot of expensive programs already, and like fine, we'll try this, and it actually works for them. It doesn't work for everybody, but that's what we hear. And, and most of the time we hear that they saved their life. And we hear that for years to come. Like I said, our social support group has people that have been there, going there every week for 17 years. And these are people we don't talk about, but they're very influential people. And it's very confidential, obviously, but the, in some of our clinics, they're just people, but you don't know the people that you work with, the CEOs, the, the bankers, the doctors, the nurses, or anything that, have, that suffer from things. They can come to a place, they can feel comfortable, but yet they know that they can get what they need, and that's what we hear all the time. I, there's a gentleman, Nick Chef, he just wrote a book about his, um, his father wrote about a boy and he just came out with a, a new book, I think it's called Clean, but he mentions us in there. He came to our program, he studied it, and great um, people, great, um, that's why I can talk about them because the book's out, you know, but um, they're amazing and they talk about that exact thing. Okay. Just a couple more questions. I'm sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Jim Shaw. I'm in two departments here. Behavioral Sciences and Criminal Justice. Yay. <laughs> in terms of the countries, I didn't know Matrix was international. In terms of the countries that, uh -huh. that Matrix is in, the Matrix model is in, mm -hmm. Abu Dhabi, I think you mentioned, parts of Africa, Vietnam, and Spain. Are you there for prevention reasons or because there's emergent need? Um, both, okay. but mostly emergent need. I, substance abuse does not discriminate no matter where you're from. Everyone's going to find some form of it. It might be prevalent in different areas, but everywhere you go, if you've traveled the world, you will see some form. Even in Fiji, where they have kava, mm -hmm. you know, bulavanaka in Fiji, that's their form of addiction. It's going to have an effect on their culture. So that's really why we're there. It's usually them calling us. In Vietnam, we did our study about 10 years ago, but they've called us back and they were like, can you come back now? Because it's through the entire country. They've okay. just saturated with matrix model, and now all the people that have been trained are raised, and they're like, please come back. And so now we're going back and we're doing refresher courses on, on helping them and understanding the model and things. Okay. Are you in the sheriff's department in Los Angeles, the programs? No. Okay. Only in the rancho office. Okay. It's the reason I ask is, County. I'm on the defense team. I'm a trial consultant, and I, I was on the defense team. And our client who was serving or looking at 35 years, I thought he mentioned 
the Matrix model as part, because he was, I mean, he was inundated with drugs, uh -huh. constant drug use. And he wanted us to know, because we were negotiating pre-trial with the district attorney, mm -hmm. wanted us to know. And I think he said he had been through the Matrix program, and he was really proud of that. And oh. Put that in his list of. You get a little pin when you graduate, a little okay. thing. I can't have one because I didn't graduate, so I'm all pinless. Yeah. You get a little pin, you get a certificate. It's a big deal. Yeah. And then we go around, and we affirm them, and say yeah, what I we. I think he was making a big deal of it. It's yeah. a, it's a big deal. I mean, it's a it's I tell you, it's a great program once you go in. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name is Andrea Williams, and I'm in. Um, Psych 86507. Um, you mentioned the family and mm -hmm. how they're included in the adult program um, or in the adolescent program, but in the adult program, are children considered um, a part of the component? If they're, if they're adult children? Or no, children, like if children. the adults are in the program, if they have children, um, no. are their children a component, maybe preventative or just how to deal with? At this time, we don't have a children. A program for children under 18 um, that aren't adolescent okay. um, that come in um, only because we have a different um, because of our state funding and things like that we haven't developed that part of the program but that's a really good question and that's a really good uh, I'm just idea. thinking children hmm. of um, children of the parents that come in they, they have children obviously but we don't have a um, yet <laughs> we don't have that segment to, to help educate the children of people recovering yet the, the babies, okay. so up to stage 12. Yeah. We don't have the 12 and under yet. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I thought this was an interesting question that came in from a student who is a uh, recovering alcoholic with 10 years of sobriety, uh, who expresses some frustration that you know 10 years into sobriety he can still romanticize the thought mm. of, of having a drink, and his question uh, relates to the relationship between the limbic system and the frontal lobe. Uh -huh. uh, he's a little surprised that that hasn't healed. Well, he's, he's wondering if there's some sort of, if, if he's hardwired, if there's some sort of, if, you've, if, if you believe that in, in alcoholics they might be kind of, if there's some sort of disconnect or pre-wired problem. Yeah. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that and does the, does the model speak to that at all? I believe that it has healed. He's not using. Mm -hmm. He's making right choices to stay sober. That's the healing part of it. We all have thoughts. I mean, come on, come on, we all have thoughts that we have to fight every day and it's not necessarily about addiction, but because he has that in him and it comes from when your parents and, and your uh, gen genetics, if he has, that's why we do genograms in programs where we see the themes in our families. If you have that hardwired in your family, you're gonna have a harder time no matter what, whether you're in an addiction or not, or whether you've had that addiction problem, but that's just the fact that he's been sober for 10 years, he's, he, he's healed and in that prefrontal cortex to the point where he can actually overcome that limbic survival mode. So I, I'm, you know, my, my hat's off to him. So I don't, I don't think he's, I think he's good. I mean. Okay, just uh, I think I have time for a, a couple more uh, quick ones here. Uh, this one's gonna re require a little bit of objectivity on, on your part here. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Are there any weaknesses or limitations associated with the, model, with the model? For example, is it best suited for certain types of addictions, genders, uh, lengths of addictions? Um, well, it is because it is the, the intensive outpatient. I mean, you can modify it. There, obviously, there's weaknesses to every model. It's not gonna fit everybody. I mean, if they need inpatient, they're gonna need inpatient for sure. We're not saying that you would not ever need inpatient treatment. Um, it's not a model for people who don't want to be in there. <laughs> but remember, with the mandated clients, they're going to start healing and then they're going to start seeing the, uh, the recovery. But if you want to just come in and, and not do the program, it's not going to work for you. Um, I, I can't say that it, it I, I believe that I've seen so many different diverse people with this model that I think it could work for any type of person as long as you have that connection with your therapist. But sometimes maybe they wouldn't have that connection, so we give them another therapist, or maybe they don't like, you know, um, say treatment at, at all. It could be it could be a cultural thing too. If you have a lot of influential factors from your family, you, that might not be appropriate for them either. So. I'm, okay, back to the frontal lobe. Sorry. If uh, I'm not a medical doctor, by the way, I'm just putting that out there, so I just, okay, FYI. Back, back to the frontal lobe here. Are there, uh, is the matrix model up effective with adolescents whose frontal lobes are not fully developed or in patients who've experienced a frontal lobe injury? 
Oh, that's a, that's a good one. The frontal lobe injury, that's that's I can't address that because I'm not a medical doctor. So if you have a um, if you have a, like a TBI or traumatic brain injury, uh, there, it's at some cogn cognitive behavioral therapies do help work. Does work a lot really well with trauma because it's psychoeducation. It's not a process group, so you're not in an unsafe place to where you have to bring up vulnerable situations. It stays light because you want to work solely on the brain and solely getting yourself uh, cognitively um, repaired. If it didn't work with adolescents, we wouldn't have a whole model on adolescent treatment. It works amazing with adolescents. It's hard enough working with them, but we've been working with them for several years now in our other location, and it's helped a lot of them come out of that. Adolescents already are working on emotion, so of course we have to connect a little more with that emotion and um, model those appropriate behaviors, but it does work with them. Okay, one more. Uh, you had mentioned that it's a very uh, um, non-confrontational uh, mm. uh, therapy. Could you? We had a number of questions come in about that, how how confrontation is avoided. Could you go into a little more detail about that? Sure. And if you study motivational interviewing, which we also do trainings in that, um, motivational interviewing is very client-centered. So it's instead of, and I'll give you an example, when you handle resistance, don't do that. I mean, your parents say don't do that. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to do exactly what they said not to do. Because when someone comes at you, you want to just fight back. You don't want to do what they say. And that's ingrained in us since childhood, right? No. But if we, if you say, for example, and this is how I explain responding to resistance in uh, motivational interviewing, it's like a Kato, when <laughs> that, that martial arts, you know, and Kung Fu, you hit them and then they fight. You, you, it hurts when you're blocking them, right? But if you're in therapy and they say, I don't, you know what, I really like using. Okay, you know what? So a Kato, what they do is, when you punch, you pull with them. And it, it's called rolling with resistance. You roll them and they fall off balance. And once they're off balance, then you can <coughs> hit them, you know? Kind of take it by surprise. So what they'd say is, I really like using. Okay, so tell me a little bit about what you like about using. And the therapist is like, wait, I'm against using. You know, you don't, it's not about you. It's about them. So let's ask them, what do you like about using? Well, it gives, makes me feel happy. It makes me feel good. I, I don't have to be with my parents or I don't have to be with my wife or my husband. And you say, okay, so tell me some not so good things about using. So you've already sucked them in. You've already told them, look, I'm on your side. I'm really trying to help understand you. And that resistance starts to fade away because they realize that you really care about them and what they're they're interested in and so and, and then you can hit them with what's not so good things and they can say well I wake up with hangovers I'm actually losing my family the court took my kids away and you're like okay so what is that like you know and in those individual type sessions then they see in themselves that they make that choice so for, for those of us that have had to make choices in our lives even as therapists it's easier when we come up with it even if it was someone else's idea other than someone telling us what to do it's easier for us to say Oh, I get it. And then you, ah, oh, you get the light on, and then you start to do it. And then they do that, it's, they call it the second order change. You know, you start doing things because it's part of you. And they say, you know what? It's really not that good that I don't have my kids. You know, and I really like using, but they, you develop that discrepancy, and then you say, okay, well, maybe I should stop for a minute. Maybe I should just start the program for just four months and see what happens. And then once their brain heals, starts to communicate, then they say, oh, wow, I really was making some poor choices there. So it gets them, you throw them off balance, you roll with their resistance, and then that's kind of less confrontational rather than, you know, this is happening to you and you're doing this and I think you should do it. It's, it's just, it, it's easier, even in our lives, I think it's easier when my friends and family don't order me. They kind of help me come up with suggestions on my own. Does that make sense? <laughs> Unfortunately, we're running out of time, okay. but before we uh, sign off, uh, a couple of quick items. And first and foremost, uh, thank you so much, <laughs> uh, you Kathy, for, for a fantastic job. On behalf of the entire university, thank you. What a, a, a fantastic, informative lecture. Thank, thank you very you. much. Also, I should mention that the recorded version of this lecture should be available within a week or so in the content section of the calsouthern.edu website. And there you'll uh, find information about our upcoming lectures as well. And our next psychology lecture will be on Friday, July 19th. And Dr. Jeffrey Zeig will return to Cal Southern to continue his exploration of the genius of Dr. Milton Erickson, this time exploring Dr. Erickson's mastery of utilization. We hope you'll attend, and we also hope that you'll invite your colleagues and friends, because the, uh, the larger and more diverse our global audience, the better the dialogue. That concludes today's presentation, and thank you very much for attending.